So uh, we're going to have someone special come up in just a moment, uh, Wendy Davis from Samaritan's Purse. But before she comes up, um, we have a video that she would like you to watch. So let's roll that video. When children open their boxes, you can hear the laughter, the cheer. Each gift brings a joy to their heart. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. I want the children to know that Jesus Christ is alive and he'll come into each and every heart that invites him. The mission of Operation Christmas Child is to share the gospel with children around the world. Every shoebox gift is delivered with a verbal and written proclamation of the gospel in more than 100 countries every year. Jesus loves you. This is an evangelism project, and it all starts with a very simple shoebox gift. Volunteers are really the heart of who we are and what we do. When we pack the boxes, it's a reflection, a little glimpse of God's love that we're pouring out. When you pack the box, pray. You never know how God is going to use that box. They go by plane, they go by riverboat, they go by motorbikes. These shoe boxes go to children in some of the most isolated areas of the world. Your shoe box goes from you filling it full of toys to all ends of the earth to share the name of Jesus Christ. This box gives us a chance to show them that there is a light, there is a truth. After receiving shoebox gifts, children are invited to a 12-lesson discipleship program, The Greatest Journey. The child is discipled, not only know God, but make God known to others. They started to know the power of prayer. They want to know more. From this, we are seeing lives transformed for the kingdom of God. cuando me dieron mi regalo a, a través de la iglesia. Solo Dios me tocó y sentí en mi corazón algo fuerte. Ya ves, yo sumergí el pecado mío desde hace tiempo y yo no puedo regresar atrás. A mí me encanta compartir lo que es la Biblia con mi hermanito pequeño, Yalil. Y yo le digo a la gente, amistades, que busquen a Dios. When I was 14 years old, I started teaching my first The Greatest Journey lesson. If I shared the gospel to them, I really, really hope that they share the gospel with everyone they know. The heart of Operation Christmas Child is evangelism, discipleship, and multiplication. Because we bring gifts to the children, the mothers and the fathers accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. In every church, we are teaching them how to reach out to their neighbors. Operation Christmas Child became the answer from God. Children are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. And it's time for us to go where no one else went, so the gospel can cover this earth just the way the water covered the ocean. Let's pray for the outreach to continue. It has to be our burden to reach them with the gospel. Millions of children around the world are being impacted by these simple shoebox gifts. So we need to keep packing those boxes and continue to pray for the children around the world as we begin to disciple them. God bless you. Thank you.
I love seeing the joy in that um, video, and that's really what Operation Christmas Child is all about, is spreading the joy of the gospel, and it's amazing, yes, what they've done over the years. Um, my name is Wendy Davis, and I am the Church Relations Coordinator for Operation Christmas Child in this area. You are all in the capital area of Maine. Operation Christmas Child divides the state into five areas, and this is the area that I serve in. Um, so today I just wanted to speak a little bit more than what the video said about some of the amazing things that are happening with the Simple Shoe Boxes Operation Christmas Child and how they are impacting the world. Um, Operation Christmas Child is a project of Samaritan's Purse, led by Franklin Graham. It started in 1970 to help people in need around the world in Jesus' name. The mission of OCC is to demonstrate God's love in a tangible way to children in need around the world and together with the local church worldwide to share the good news of Jesus Christ. This is such an important ministry because there are currently over 2 billion children in the world under the age of 14. So it really is an active um, ministry field. Um, as kind of shown in the video, one of the ways that the program works is actually by equipping local volunteers and Christian um, uh, people already in the country. So OCC doesn't go in and present these programs. They train people to do that so that when they leave, there's still people there that are trained to do the gospel. So it truly is a church to church ministry. We over here in the United States, we're called a, um, we're one of the countries that send. We're called a sending church. And there are, if I can remember, uh, I think 11, 10, 10 other countries besides. So there is 11, if you include the United States, countries that send, countries like Great Britain, France, Canada. But the United States is, sends the most by far. Um, Yes, we, it's, it's, we've been blessed in the United States to be able to do that. Um, there's 170 receiving countries, so, and that grows every year. You know, there's a lot of things in play then when we try to get into a country, and some don't want us. Let's face it. <laughs> That's the world we live in. So, um, but since 2009, 1.9 million volunteer teachers have been trained from local churches and countries. So it's, a, it's an amazing project. So at an outreach event, these local believers that have been trained tell the boys and girls about God's greatest gift, Jesus Christ. And they give them one of these books. This book comes with every shoebox, and it's in the child's language whenever possible. And it's a simple presentation of the gospel. Because let's face it, the gospel doesn't need to be complicated. It needs to be told in a way that can be understood, and they make sure that happens. So every box gets one of these. And just as a side note, when this Operation Christmas Child started, it didn't include a gospel component. It was presented to Franklin Graham from a pastor to give boxes to a country that was in need, and they were just giving them in the name of Jesus just to help this country that was in a, I'm not sure if it was in a war or if they just were experiencing poverty, but. They said, you know, this sounds like a good idea to cheer up the children. But as God often does, when they added the gospel component, guess what happened? The program exploded. And then they couldn't keep up almost. So we all know the power of the gospel. After they get their box, and they're all offered the opportunity to enroll in a 12-week discipleship program called The Greatest Journey, no one is made to do this. Because as we know, you can't make someone accept Jesus. So they're offered it. And the, the journey takes them more into not only salvation, but of course discipleship and evangelism. So we've seen in many countries that children, of course, tell their parents, or their parents may hear about Jesus at one of these outreach events, and then that accumulates in the community hearing, and churches have been planted. And this has all come from shoe boxes. So if they go through all 12 steps of the greatest journey, they get a New Testament. And it has some Old Testament in it too, but it's mostly New Testament. And I'm going to give you some numbers on that in just a minute. But um, like I said, oftentimes this multiplies how many people hear about the gospel. And after completing, like I said, all 12 lessons, they have a graduation ceremony and they get the Bible. And since 2009, over 20 million children have made decisions for Christ. 
So that's amazing. And the neat thing about this ministry is it's not that hard to participate. You can do so by packing a shoebox, and that spreads the gospel. The shoeboxes are very easy to pack. There's very few restrictions. We ask people to pray and let God lead you as to what to put in those boxes because he knows what child's going to get it, and he knows what that child needs. And so he will lead you. There are a few restrictions, like probably some you can think of. You can't send candy or any food. Toothpaste, I know that's a weird one, but and any war-themed items, but really there's not many restrictions. And most of these restrictions that we do have are because of customs. Um, like they, they give us trouble getting the boxes through. Like next year, soap will not be allowed because so many shipments were getting held up with soap by customs that it's just not worth it anymore because we want these boxes to get through as soon as possible. So we try to... Um, cooperate with customs as much as we can. But really, the key is prayer to see what God will lead you. Um, and then, like I always tell people when you're packing, the most important thing is prayer. Prayer with your box is the most important thing because this ministry is built on prayer. It's almost all volunteers, right up through the higher-ups. There's very few people that get paid in Operation Christmas Child, and it's just all done through prayer. That's what holds us up. So the video you watched about the great impact that shoeboxes have on children, and now I'm just going to give you a little proof, because I don't know about you, but I like numbers to see how things are working. And through OCC, and this is every 24 hours, 28,755 children hear the gospel, 12,202 enroll in the greatest journey, 8,727 graduate from the greatest journey, 6,699 accept Jesus, and 6,611 commit to pray and share the gospel. So those are amazing numbers. And when I'm looking where to place my time, because we all have limited time, and we all need to use our time wisely, God tells us to use our resources wisely, I look for things that tell me this organization is working. And I always knew this in two ways. One, these numbers tell it, and I'm going to tell you a few others in a second. Secondly, I'm going to tell you, as a year-round volunteer, when I went to sign up, they make it very clear to you, when you're a volunteer for them, your main purpose in life is to have your life right with God. That's what they want, number one, in a volunteer. Number two, they want your family life to be godly. Number three, they want your church life to be active and particip you participating in your church life. Number four is organizations like OCC. So you know when an organization has its priorities in order, that they're, they're, they're doing what God would want them to do. So I always thought that was such a blessing to be a part of. So last year, worldwide, was collected 11,330,126 shoeboxes that's worldwide, and that was the most that's ever been collected. So that's just amazing. In Maine, we collected 48,098. And in the capital area, which is the area you're part of, we collected, and I've got to find my number. <laughs> it's hard sometimes when you're looking down at all, 10,207 boxes. So we do very well. Yes, that's a blessing. This year, the goal for Maine is 50,000. And we all know what a special place Maine is because we choose to live here. But let me tell you something. Maine collects the most shoeboxes per capita of any state in the union. So that's amazing. When you go and visit with other states, they'll say that we're part of the frozen north. Okay? But the frozen north can produce when God's people decide to. So that's exciting. Um, I was blessed in 2003 to be able to attend a Franklin Graham convention for OCC people in Florida. And at that, we celebrated the 200 millionth shoebox. And it went to a little girl in Ukraine, by the way. It was a blessing. At this conference, though, Franklin Graham, Dr. Graham, reminded me of something. He said that packing as many shoeboxes as possible each year because he believes the time is getting short. Um, he believed this for a couple of reasons, that maybe Jesus is coming soon, which, of course, we all are looking forward to, or that countries will stop letting us in. 
And as the world is going, as we heard about Rwanda, and by the way, I sponsor a child through the program that you do, you can see where anti-Christian thought or anti-Christian actions are getting um, more on the rise, I guess I want to say. And so there's two fears. Like, it's not a fear, Christ is coming back, but he wants to get as many children saved as possible before that. But the countries may stop letting us in. You just never know. So we need to, to push forward as quickly as possible. So just to end, I want to thank you for the 52 shoeboxes you all packed last year. They say for every shoebox packed, there's seven people saved, because that means um, family members and friends that get saved through that child. So as you can see, those 52 boxes were wonderful. And we call these boxes now Go Boxes, which means gospel opportunities. And so you'll hear that term, Go Box. And I met a lady at the Florida conference that was from the South, and she told me, she said, and I'm not going to do her accent well, <laughs> but she said, those boxes aren't boxes, they're souls. And that just really struck with me, you know, because these are just simple shoe boxes, but they have so much power because all the prayers are with them. And so I just want to encourage you in that. And I want to thank you for having me. I always love to come worship with God's family. I love um, seeing how the Holy Spirit works through congregations, and, and I just feel that here today, and thank you so much, and I hope you'll have, be inspired maybe to pack a lot of shoeboxes this year. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. 20 million souls saved. All right, word of prayer. Word of prayer. That's, um, that's an unbelievable number. Thank you, Jesus. Lord Jesus, we're looking for you to move in power today. Through your word, speak through your word. And through that powerful prism of your Holy Spirit and just, just coming, that light shining down and hitting each person exactly in the color that they need to hear it today, Lord, and the way that they need to receive it. I pray, Jesus, that everyone in this room, everyone watching the live stream, everyone who picks this up later and, and, and watches the message and hears your word, Anyone sitting out there by the fireplace, God, watching on the screen, you would speak no matter where or when. You would. No man, no person, nor the thought. You speak. Let it come through with your power. We want to always and in everything honor you. That's our greatest desire, Jesus. So help us to do just that. We ask it in your holiest name. Amen. Amen. We are in our final chapter of Acts, moving chapter by chapter by chapter through the Word of God. We are in Acts. We've done the four gospel. Well, we did John and then Acts, I think is how I, each time I go back, I go back to a different gospel. Uh, Old Testament on Wednesday nights, chapter by chapter, we're in Exodus, which has been an unbelievable run this year. It's taken the year. Uh, really, if you get the chance, come on a Wednesday night. Come and see what God's doing on the, in the Old Testament. If you don't, watch online. Check it out. See it. It's been a powerful, powerful series of things that God's been showing us. This, whew, all right. This is Acts 28, and I'm only going to get through part of it, like 10 verses. Uh, so we'll stay in Acts next week. Last chapter means nothing to me. <laughs> Acts 28, 1, reads like this. Oh, and back, back story, back story. Not everybody was here last week. And not everybody is sticking to their reading. <laughs> Hope you are. You should be reading the chapter ahead. Who, re who read Acts 28? Oh, gosh, you're killing me, people. You're killing me. Read it. Just, just know it's so cool. It's such an amazing word. All right, Acts 28. Leaves, it leaves off at 27 where Paul 
Uh, he's being sent to Rome. He's appealed to Rome. He's appealed to Caesar. He knows the Jews locally are trying to kill him, but that's not even really the reason. He knows he needs to preach the gospel in Rome. They put him on a boat, and he tells them all by Cyprus. He's like, listen, it is late in the season for sailing. This is a horrible idea. Let's not sail any further. Everything we've done so far has been just roadblock after roadblock seasonally. Let's just let this go. Let's, let's stay right here at Fair Havens, wait for the winter to go by, and then we'll try again. I want to get to Rome just as much as you all do, even though I'm a prisoner. And... They decide, the sailors do, and they vote on it, and then, and, then, and then the Roman cohort's like, yeah, we agree with these guys, not Paul, not the man of God, and so they go. So they listen to the world over God, and they just move into a hurricane, what they call a northeaster. It's a different, different version than ours, but uh, much more dangerous. It's, they're, they're swamped. They're, they're 14 days at sea. They throw the tackle, which is the means of steering the ship overboard to stay alive. Just take the steering wheel and toss it. They, they, they cut all their anchors. They cut the lifeboat. They run ashore. The, the pounding surf is breaking the ship apart, and everyone's got to jump and swim for shore or they've got to find a floating piece of something or someone else that can swim and let them drag you ashore. All 276 of them make it. Paul says they will. He said, don't worry, guys. God spoke to me that this hurricane's not going to kill you if you will follow these instructions. There was, there was a few addendums attached of obedience to God's word, which they had completely ignored up until that point. But they're listening now. As the ship's breaking apart and they're running to the other side to jump in the churning water. And they are just, everyone, everyone is dragging themselves ashore, you know. Some, a couple guys are surfing luckily onto a piece of board that, you know, made it. But I had a friend, an assistant pastor, he would wait for hurricanes in Florida because he was a surfer. And he'd go to wherever the hurricane was because that's when the waves were actually really churning, you know. And he would just love it. He'd take videos. I was like, you are a wild man. You're crazy. He, he was like those tornado chasers, but he did it with whole, full-on hurricanes. And so some of these guys make it in like that. Most of them are just gasping for air. They all survive. Now, generally, when you land, they don't recognize the shore, and they don't know where they are. It ends up being Malta, or at least the Maltese Islands. It might have been an island called Dalmatia, but we'll talk about that. So they land on Malta. And they're all on the shore, and everybody's, everybody's just dragging themselves up the beach. And if, when you land on an island like that, and you don't know where you are, I mean, if you've seen any movies, you know that you don't really trust the islanders right out the gate. You know, <laughs> they might eat you. <laughs> they might do something to you. You, you, they don't, you don't know them. They don't know you, and you're all coming up on shore. You know, you ever watch Treasure Island? The things, the bad things can happen. And so they get there, and, and the word says they showed unusual kindness. So let's just read where they are right now. Once safely on shore, and this is Luke writing, remember. Luke's writing Acts. Luke, the doctor, is writing Acts. He is Paul's very dear companion. Aristarchus is with him, too. These are two guys that decided to board the boat with him to Rome, knowing he might be in the arena or get executed when he gets there. They're going with him because they consider the gospel getting to Rome that valuable. Once safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and they welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood and as he put it on the fire, a viper driven out by the heat fastened itself on his hand. When the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, This man must be a murderer, for though he escaped from the sea, the goddess Justice has not allowed him to live. But Paul shook the snake into the fire, and he suffered no ill effects. The people expected him to swell up or suddenly fall dead, but after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, 
they changed their minds and they said he was a god. There was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius or Publius, the chief official of the land, the island. He welcomed us to his home. He showed us generous hospitality for three days. There's 276 of these guys. <laughs> you know, that is some pretty generous hospitality. I don't know if they're all invited. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went in to see him after prayer, placed his hands on him, and healed him. When this had happened, the rest of the sick people on the island came and were cured. They honored us in many ways, and when we were ready to sail, they furnished us with the supplies that we needed. All right, there's a lot going on in these 10 verses. First, you've got Paul, because he is a servant, because he's a servant of God and he just has a servant's heart, he's collecting firewood. He's helping them. They've, already, they've started the fire. They've got it and he sees the fire's dying down, needs some more wood. He goes and gets it. It's raining, it's cold, it's freezing, and he goes out and gets away from the fire and gets more. And as he's bringing it back, and you get close to the fire, the fire, the heat, it drives out the viper that was hiding in what he was carrying. And it bites him. There's a, there's a lot of pieces to this scene. Here's one. Paul is used to being obedient to God and that leading him into troubled waters. He's used to it. He doesn't throw up his hands and go, see, I did what you want, I've been obedient, God, and here's what you did in my life. Why can't I have things just turn out good? Why can't, you know, I'm following you closely, closer than all these yahoos, and, and my life's hard? Why, why is that? I'm doing exactly what you asked. I'm trying so hard. I get jailed. I get beat. I get stoned to death. Thanks for bringing me back. And then I walk back into town and preach again. And, and I, like, I, I'm doing everything you want, and then everything bad happens. And he doesn't do that. You never even find him doing that. He is so clearly identifying as a sinner saved by grace that he's so deeply involved in gratitude for God that he can get bit on the hand while helping and still raise his hands to heaven and focus on the king. He says, oh, what? Good, take me home. Uh, you know, <laughs> I've had enough. Bite me again. You know, <laughs> Uh, I, you know, I've been really at this for a long time. And, and he's not. He's just constantly thanking God. He constantly stays in a position of seeking God. He constantly stays in a position of thankful that his sins didn't send him to hell, which he knows he narrowly avoided. He's so cued in on gratitude that he's not cued in on his rights as a Christian that should have been treated better by his heavenly father. It's not his attitude. He, do you think he's tired and freezing cold like everybody else? I wouldn't have left the fire. I don't like the cold. I've been like, the fire. <laughs> they made us a fire. Any islanders want to go get some more wood? Careful, they got snakes. So part one is, you don't find Paul complaining. When, they, when no one listens to him at Fair Havens, he clearly explains they're going to have a loss of cargo and possibly life, and they're definitely going to lose the ship if they proceed. They do it anyway. Everyone but Paul says we should move forward. I'm sure Luke and Aristarchus are like, please listen to this guy. He does amazing things through the power of Christ. Just, just listen to him. 
Nobody does. And off they go. And it's just, no one eats for 14 days, much less the prisoners. Don't forget, that's what Paul is. You kind of forget it because he's running the show. Once the storm starts, he's giving all the directions. Paul's giving all the directions. Uh, I wouldn't let those sailors cut that lifeboat loose and get away because then you all die. That's God's direction. Okay, Psst, lifeboat's gone. Um, don't let anybody try, don't kill the prisoners, of which I'm one. I know that sounds like I'm trying to save myself, but if you do, we all, if we're all 276 don't get on that island, none of the 276 gets on that island. Do you understand? And Julius like, got it. And so Paul is running the show. He's giving them directions. It gets to the point where Julius is just like, everybody's looking at him, what do you do? And he's like, Paul, what should we do? <laughs> he's asking the prisoner, like he said, whatever he says is what we should do. And he's just, he's running it. And he's the prisoner. He gets invited to the, to the governor's house when he gets there. And, they, and the governor has him go in and pray over his very sick father. He's a prisoner that the governor doesn't know. Don't you think that's a pretty high level of trust? Here, here's all the prisoners. One of them would like to pray for your dad. Now? Like in a private room? Like, like, he must have done something that you guys are mad at him for, you know. He's going to just let him come right in, pray for his dad. He gets healed. Why did that happen? Because everybody saw how Paul was living under duress. Everyone saw how Paul was behaving while things were going horribly for him. And then they saw the, mirac the miraculous ways that God was moving as he acted in obedience to God. So instead of him going, wow, I was obedient, and then, then a hurricane, that's amazing, because now no one's going to eat for 14 days, we're going to throw our steering wheel overboard, that's awesome. He doesn't. He's just like, oh, okay, so here's what we need to do. He does say, you guys should listen to me. Yeah, I told you so. But he then quickly recovers with, listen, if you all want to survive, we've got to do this, this, and this, and they do it. Everybody told the islanders, I know he's a prisoner, and we can't figure that out ourselves, but I'd have him pray for your dad. God is obviously closely working with this dude, so it's okay if he goes in and prays. We, you know, we trust him. He carried a reputation because people saw how he lived. That's, 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 that's one thing about the snake. Here's another. Do you know that there are only four types of snakes that live on Malta? And none of them are dangerous to people? Malta doesn't have poisonous snakes. It doesn't have vipers. There's one called a cat snake. And they call it a cat snake because it's nocturnal. And its eyes have pupils like cats. All the other snakes don't. They're more rounded. But these ones have like cat's eyes. They're really cool looking if you like if you're any herpetologists out there. So, so it's, got, it, it's got cat's eyes because it hunts at night. So it's a nocturnal snake. The other ones are more diurnal. They're day, in the daytime. But this one hunts by night. It's the only one. It's not indigenous to the island. It got, it got, it got taken from like Alexandria. These ships that would come from Egypt, they would sometimes bring wood and they'd bring lumber and they'd bring supplies and snakes would get in the boat. Some of them that did fairly well would remain on the island. Other ones didn't do so well. Dalmatia, an island very near it in the Maltese Islands, well, one, of, one of the ones that they might have been on. They're not sure if it was Malta or Dal, Dalmatia because they could be commonly called Malta, just like Hawaii, but it's got seven, you know, seven islands. That one has vipers. But even the vipers that it has generally don't kill you. So, like, what's the deal with the snake and the stick? Like, he picks up the stick, he, you know, he's throwing it, and it's driven out by the heat, and it bites him. And it's a viper. Luke tells you, the Word tells you, and Peter tells you, men only wrote the Word of God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So there's a truth in it. It's a viper. The same word is used in the New Testament to describe Satan. The same word is used in the New Testament to describe how the Pharisees and the Sadducees poison, their poison, poisonous teaching was like a viper. 
So just understand, we're talking about a viper. It was a, it was a poisonous snake that bit him. The islanders are waiting for him very specifically to either swell up, which is what you'll often do if you get that type of venom inside of you, is, is you'll, you know, that, that limb will swell up. I don't know if you've ever seen like rattlesnake victims and stuff, the whole leg's all swollen up until sometimes it even rips open. Like it's pretty gross. Uh, and, and different types of poisons are much more dangerous. Coral snake. But the, 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 Islanders are waiting to, for two specific things. He's either going to swell up or he's going to fall down dead based on why are they thinking that? That's pretty specific. They're thinking that because they've seen this before. If that kind of snake bites a human, they either swell up or they die kind of fast. They're waiting for one of those things to happen. It's not, we know they're superstitious because they say, oh, the goddess justice just killed him. He made it in, swam it in, but she's like, no, he's gone. Get it, um, snake. We'll kill him with a snake. And then he doesn't die, and they're like, he's a god. So obviously they're massively superstitious. But you don't wait for specific symptoms unless you've seen it before. They're watching, they're looking, and they're shocked that it doesn't happen. Do you think the islanders never got bit by a whip snake, which is also on the island? Of course they have. They are known to be extremely aggressive, like our stupid garden snakes, or guard, gardens, gardener, yeah, gardener. They're all from gardener. Those stupid green and yellow ones that are just like the most violent snake known to man, and they wrap around you and bite you. They can't even hurt you, but they just keep trying. Serious Napoleon complex in those snakes. There's a whip snake, real dark, looks like a skinny little whip, and they're super violent. People get bit by those things all the time on the island, super known. Today they do. You don't play with them because they bite you. They can't poison you, and it's not going to hurt you that much. You could shake it off in the fire and have nothing wrong. I'd put an antiseptic on it. Yeah. The leopard snake's real pretty. Looks kind of poisonous. That's on the island too. It's not poisonous. The cat snake is poisonous, but to rodents. If it, but it's got like back teeth that have poison and venom, venom in them, and they, they can inject you, but it's just going to be like a bee sting, a glorified bee sting. You're not going to die from it, even if you don't treat it. Rodents will. That's what it's for. So where's this viper from? So more superstition. Oh, St. Paul cursed all venomous snakes, and that's why there's no venomous snakes on the island. More likely, snakes that were vipers came in on different ships and were there for a period of time and then weren't anymore because they didn't make it. And that makes a ton of sense in how Satan often operates. He will bring in something to your life while you're trying to follow God, while you're being obedient, while you're looking to try to zing you with it and get you ineffective, unproductive, swell up, and possibly die. What he's trying to do is distract you from the thing that God has you doing, and you get snake bit. See, what happened is Paul got snake bit at Malta. He, he's trying to do the right thing, and he gets snake bit, and, and he himself... He shakes it off, shakes it off into the fire. What he's really done is he's made an offering. He's made like a sin offering to the Lord. He's shaken this thing off in the fire so it'll burn. And so he'll never see it again. And then he focuses so heavily on his God that the poison that was in him can't hurt him. You're going to get snake bit. People are going to say things that you cannot believe they would say to you. Even right here, even right today, someone say some stinging thing, and you're like, oh, wow, why would you do that? Or some thought of some family member you, that you're upset with just comes crashing back on top of you. Or some event, you know, a fear. 
and you get snake bit. And it happened when you were just collecting wood for Christ. It happened while you were just trying to do the right thing. You can get snake bit by real things that just happen. Or deals that happen in your life you had nothing to do with. They just came on you while you were doing your business. And it was hidden in the very thing that you were doing. Not even usually there, but it was this day. And you got snake bit. I was sharing on Wednesday night and reminding people, and I'll do it again today because it's been so on me, so obviously God t- wants, wants me to speak about it. But in Numbers 21, starting around verse 4 or 8, somewhere in there, the people of God start complaining. They're doing exactly what Paul didn't do. They're like, we're following you, we're doing what you asked, and you just keep giving us the same food and the same rules and marching through a desert, and the thing moves, we move. The, the pillar of cloud moves, we move. What are we even doing? It's been a long journey. What are we even doing here? Why are we doing all this? We're sick of this food you've given us, God. It's boring. We're sick of it. That's what they say. And God puts venomous snakes in their midst. And they start biting the people, and the people start dying. And Moses cries out to the Lord, because the people say, hey, cry out to God for us, stop this. They sound just like Pharaoh. We don't like what God's doing. Plague, stop, get Moses, pray for us. Pray for us to make it stop. And then the next chapter, they're doing something else. But he does, he prays for him. Hey, make a pole, put a bronze snake on it. They call it Nehushtan. Look at it, stare at it when you get bit. Keep staring at it until the poison leaves your body. Keep staring at the bronze snake on the stick till the poison leaves your body. And the Word tells you over and over, and in, in the New Testament, that that is Jesus on the cross. That that's a, that's a model of Jesus on the cross. And the more you recognize that he died in your stead as a sin offering, and you just keep staring at that, and you keep understanding it, it draws a lot of that poison out of you that's, well, I've got rights. I shouldn't be treated this way. Or I'm so afraid. Or I'm so angry. Or I'm so offended. It just draws, or I'm so lied to. The problem, a big problem of ours is we have been lied to repeatedly by worldly thoughts and ideas that you have grown up in and you just accept them as just normal. You've been lied to. You've been snake bit. So how do you tackle that problem? You do what Paul did. Focus on the Word of God that you know and keep staring at it and praying about it and thinking about it and going over it and getting into it and and then praying for Him to reveal more of it to you until it starts to erase the poison that is rising up inside of you. That's how you do it. And the angrier you are and the more deceived you've been And the more guilty you feel over your own sin, not repentant, just feeling sick about it. That's different. Repentance is a beautiful place. But if you're just stuck in guilt and you feel worthless, that's not where he wants you either. Because he all, listen, the model of the tabernacle is you burn the sin offering, then they surgically, carefully scraped out all of the ashes and put them outside of camp, outside of where you live, outside of God's presence. So you never look at them again. And then, the, and then it moves on and you're over here and that sin stayed over there. It doesn't come back. So the winds don't blow them back your way. It's gone. And that's how God sees it. So you don't live in guilt of what you did or who you were. You don't live in guilt as what you did as a Christian and why, oh, I was deceived and I did that or I'm just, I, was, I wasn't deceived, I just did it because I was mad. That's just, I just did it. Shouldn't have done that. It's over there, people. 
Look at Nehushtan. Look at Christ on the cross. Keep looking at him and the freedom that he gives and the love that he has and the promise that he has for eternal life. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be guilty. You don't have to be sad. You don't have to be broken. You don't have to live in betrayal. You don't have to live in, oh, I gotta get that person back. I gotta get, I gotta get that person back. I gotta think about the ways I can say something in a public place. You don't have to live there. No you don't have to live in condemnation. You don't have to live in a place where you're going to keep feeling hurt because Jesus took it at the cross. And when you like, but I do live there and I'm still feeling it. That's when you stare at the bronze snake until you understand the value of it. Keep looking. It's not a flippant look and a, oh, healed, oh, healed, oh, healed. It's not that. It's not that. You didn't, it's not a booster shot. You don't get a, a Christ immunization by just staring at it real fast and waiting in line. You keep lying there until the poison comes out. It's how Paul lived his life. What else do you do? Live your life obediently in the next set of steps that he gives you. Just do the next righteous thing that he gives you to do, no matter how you feel. No matter how you, because your feelings aren't the barometer for God's will. So you can, so you can be snake bit simply by being deceived. I'll give you an example. I will, I will purposefully, purposefully avoid political things while I'm preaching. Because what I want to do, what I want you to do is focus on the Word of God and not have you just quickly just go, oh, 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 he said that about a Democrat. Oh, he said that about a Republican. And then you're out. You're gone. You're not even listening anymore. I'm going to ask you to listen. Just listen. Listen. Because I'm not attaching anything other than the Word of God to this, but I need you to listen. This is Luke 1, starting at verse 26. I didn't put this up there, so you don't have to. Just, you can just listen to it. You can put it up if you want. It's Luke 1, starting at 26. Birth of Jesus foretold. Oh, sorry. It's not actually where I want to be. I want to go a little further. Luke 1:39. She's already met the angel, Gabriel. He told her, you're going to have the Son of God, and you'll have it in this miraculous way. You're not going to have any union with your husband. It's going, to be, it's going to be God overshadowing you, and you're going to get pregnant. And this is what happens. At that time, Mary got ready, and she hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child that you'll bear. Why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. I saw this stunning thing that I just hadn't seen that my sister-in-law showed me. I think she saw it on, uh, online somewhere. The first person to recognize the Christ was a fetus. The per first person to recognize that Christ had come in the flesh, that the Son of God had come to visit earth, was a baby in the womb. And when it jumped, the mother filled with the Holy Spirit because the word said that John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit from birth. And you've been told, mass of cells, just a fetus, doesn't matter. Not until birth. That's when... <gasps> Alive. No. Because we know from the word of God itself 
that the word says in Psalm 139, I was knit together in my mother's womb. I was knit together there. Life is life. Leave it alone. Will it die? Life is life. Abortion kills babies. It's that simple. There's nothing in between. It doesn't make me hate someone who made that mistake. You ought to be all the more willing to love and move towards that person because they're dealing with a whole lot of pain. And an organization called Resolve, who we hosted a banquet for here on Friday and filled the whole place with people that were here to listen to the testimonies and the things that they do. What they do is save lives. And they do it with free ultrasounds, free car seats, free formula, free outfits for your children, uh, all kinds of people standing around supporting you, trying to help you make a better decision than terminating that baby's life. And a doctor spoke who does all kinds of surgeries in the womb, brain surgery in the womb. Brain surgery, heart surgery in the womb. One of the pictures was the little hand reaching out from the womb and grabbing a hold of the surgeon's finger while he was working on him. Two anesthesiologists, one for the patient that's the baby, one for the patient that's the mom. It's a life. And there's a whole agenda that says that we should not consider it that. And it's frustrating to me. It's a lie. It's a lie. It's a horrible lie. 63 million children have died because of that lie. So you surgically kill a child and that's just clean and okay? It isn't. Well, that's reproduction rights. No, it's not. What rights did the baby have? It's evil. It's sin. And everything in the word would stand against it. So if you vote a platform for it, please reconsider. Please reconsider. A platform against it is against the word of God. Choose. The reason this election is so violently separate, so torn, and why so many people are really struggling is because some things have been put on the table. We're going to go as far as we can from the word of God. You can be male or female, and you can switch back and forth, and we'll even encourage your children to do that when you're not even there present. And, 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 and if... And if it's just a fetus, then you can just kill it. We're just going to keep moving in this direction. If you support that agenda. The reason I put the two agendas up on the, on the site was so you could look at it and then remove the names. Forget the names. Pick what follows God's word or doesn't. You've got to do that with everything in your life. You've got to do that or you bend snake bit. And understand that the poison won't come out until you challenge yourself with the word of God. Don't tell me who you like and who you don't like. I don't care who you like. Do you like the word of God and do you trust that it's real? If you do, it's got to be something that you'd support with everything in your life, including your vote. The nation's going one way or another. I don't care who you like. And I'm not telling you how to vote other than this. If you're a believer sitting in this room, don't vote for someone that says abortion is good and builds a platform on it. It's not okay.
Please do. Please do. Yo, I'm with you 100%. I'm angry because we just saw 20 million people got saved through the effort of people sending boxes. And then there's an agenda that says we've killed 63 million. Let's improve on our efforts. Now, should someone make that mistake, jump all over it to help them. Help them before they make it. Our issue isn't really even the issue. The issue is love or not love. Anything. If it doesn't line up with the word of God, someone said to Billy Graham, Franklin Graham's dad, someone said to Billy Graham, if your son became a homosexual, would you still love him? And he said, of course, based on the word of God, I need to love him more. Such a fantastic answer from a fantastic representative of the kingdom. And you'd better do the same thing. Because what Paul did was he recognized his own sin so deeply that when the sailor said, no, that's stupid, we're sailing, he didn't hate them for it. And when it made him not eat for two weeks and almost die in the crash, he didn't hate them for it. Jesus says, I'm going to give you all 276 people on this ship. It's okay, Paul. I'm going to give them all to you. That means your captors, the ones who just said we should kill the prisoners, he doesn't hold that against them. He wants them all to live forever. He wants them all to live. Your, your point's fantastic. It's the reality we've got to love. I am not against a person. We don't fight flesh and blood, it tells us in Ephesians 6. But boy, we do fight lies. Snake bit lies. And we're loaded with them. The media is loaded with them. This, who runs this world? What does the word tell you? Who runs it? I'm hearing mixed reviews. God's in charge of it. But there's a God of this world who runs your media. There's a God of this world who runs the thought process of anyone who doesn't know Christ. We're just bought and sold into it. You're born into it. And if you don't recognize that, get into the Word and find it. It's a reality. Vote. I don't care who you vote for, but don't vote for someone who blatantly is against the Word of God. Please don't do that if you're a believer. There were six options. Our God just has to speak what he's got to speak, and we just got to follow it. And if we do, if we do, if we do, you'll live. And you can shake the snake off into the fire and not be poisoned. We're, we're doing communion. Uh, I'm going to have to clip it. I wanted to go further. I got a lot, there's a lot more in that 10 verses. There's a lot more. I probably have to hit, hit it. I was going to say next week, but I'll be gone for two weeks. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Didn't run that by anyone because I didn't want to, to run into problems. I, I want to go see my new grandson. So we're going to be, go my, we're going to be gone for two weeks, two Sundays. Uh, you're in tremendous hands, obviously. We're in his hands. And we've got wonderful people at this church and know just what they're doing. But what I'm asking is that we're going to do communion. And we're going to sing a song, actually. Keely, where are you? Come on up and join me. Keely is going to sing you a song. I'm just going to play with her. And uh, this, she's from our youth group. <laughs> and we sang this song in worship. And I know we're a little over time. Don't pay attention to that. And so I'm going to ask you to do, I'm going to be, yeah, perfect. I'm going to be right here, but you've got lyrics right there, right? Uh, should we do this? Use one of... Christy's mic, so you're going to use that one. The pink one. How appropriate. Now, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Please. I've got people that will quickly 
ready to jump up and pray with you. I'm going to be playing, but they're willing to pray with you. We're doing communion. I'm going to do it first. Normally we play the music and kind of set it up. I'm not. We're going to do communion right now. And then I'm going to play the song. Keely's going to sing it. And the Holy Spirit's going to move. If you're like, wow, I've been snake bit. It might just be that there's some stinging thing that keeps plaguing you right now and you just want it out. Then come up and pray with somebody. Or just get at the altar and pray to God yourself. But there will be people waiting here. So, so once we're done passing this out, some of the people that are prayer warriors, I want you to come up and just be ready to pray with people. We've got a team that's ready to go. And, and come up. Like, don't hesitate. Once that starts to happen, if we get, if we get stuck there, if we crash land on Malta, don't forget that Malta is a resort today, by the way. It's a resort. People aspire to go to Malta. Paul had a magnificent time at Malta. It was a, it was a complete vacation from what he was experiencing. That winter in Malta was a gift to him. While we do communion, just be preparing your heart like, Lord, just do this. It says we should prepare our hearts. Just do this. Lord, if I have been snake bit, maybe I'm not even aware of it. If I've been snake bit, if I've been deceived, uh, the, what's the definition of being deceived? You don't know it. You're deceived. So if I've been deceived, or, or, or if I'm just dealing with some stuff that's way over my head, I'm just asking you, Jesus, who died for my sin, to take the poison out. Take the poison out. Why do we do this? Because Jesus' body was broken for us and his blood was shed for us to remove sin and to give us a new life. A new creation doesn't have to live in a broken place. Just making sure everybody's got it. We normally do the music right here so there's no awkward pause. And because it helps set your heart, but I really need to do it afterwards today. So I'm going to wait till you have it. It's okay, people that are passing it out. This is not sacrilegious for you to keep passing it out while I pray, but I'm going to pray. So just you know, keep your eyes open enough to... Lord Jesus, would you, God, move in such power that any of us who are wrestling with thought, maybe even wrestling with what I just said, we just take it to you. You'll answer. You'll answer. But I pray, God, that all of us, and me included, because I got snake bit myself, that we would just take it to you and let you remove the poison. We take it to you and let you remove the poison as we shake that thing off into the fire of your burning grace. Praise you, Lord, the fire of the altar is always burning. It was always burning in the tabernacle and it's always burning today. I pray, Father, it'll always be burning in us so we also have a heart of forgiveness. So we have forgiveness fires burning because of your Holy Spirit so that we, like you, will forgive. Forgive us, Father, for we've, we've sinned. That's part of it. But help us to forgive like you forgive. We want the poison out. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thanks. Did you get me? Did you get me? One, two. Would it mess up your singing if you take it with us? Okay. All right. So we'll, we'll hold. Is there anyone? Does everybody have them? Okay. All right. All right. Be patient. You, it's coming. Wow. Wow. Chill. It's coming. I love the eagerness. To participate. <laughs> Amen. 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 Everybody all the way across has it. We just, it, Isaac's working on it. He's finishing it up. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Just a, just a note, and I know I've said it, but the whole point to this 
is as we've been studying on Wednesday nights, we have been realizing that when they would do sacrifices at the burning altar, the first thing you see when you come into the tabernacle, as they did sacrifices, they would eat most of those sacrifices. The priests lived off of those sacrifices. It's a, it's a giant hibachi, and they're putting steaks on the grill. It's constant. It's a constant grilling. It smells amazing, and they watch the burning inferno every day of their sins going away. And they would eat it. They would even lay their hands on the substitutionary animal, and they knew that their sin was being sent to that animal, and then that animal went on the altar and burned in the fire instead of the person that sinned. They got that because they touched it, because they brought it from home to give it up, touch it, and, and that was their substitute. Understand that's what we're doing. When God said, when Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, he's saying, I am the, the sacrifice in your stead, and you're going to eat it. You're going to eat it. You're going to ingest it. It's going to become a part of who you are as you digest it. Digest who I am. As it cracks between your teeth, that's my body broken for you. Take that together. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus was so specific. He said, this is the wine of the new covenant. It's my blood poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me because it's my blood poured out for you. But you're going to ingest it. You're going to have to eat my body and drink my blood. That's what he told them. Take that together. One moment, this has been sitting as the room warmed up. Relax, it's not the song. Lord Jesus, the song, lay it down. We sing it to you. We sing because we want to lay down any venom or poison that's been injected into us. And we want to walk out of here free and healthy because we were staring at the sacrifice that you had on the cross for our sins. The epicenter of all time, our salvation, and what makes us a new creation. The receiving of that. Praise you, Jesus. If you don't even know who Jesus is, you should come up and pray with someone. Invite Christ into your heart and understand what this is all about.
Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Lord Jesus, look down at your people. We don't want to be snake bit. We don't want to be deceived, tricked, angry, frustrated, fearful, anxious. We don't want to live in these ways. We don't want to live in a condemned state. We're a new creation in Christ, and we want to access that, and we want to own that. I identify as a Christian. I identify as one saved by grace that's got no business being here. I love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. There are so many people in this kingdom of priests in this room who have gifts and talents that you are getting ready to expose, that you're getting ready to bring right to the surface, that you're getting ready to minister with and minister through. Lord Jesus, the shocking thing you said in that verse today was that Paul, and someone brought up to me right before service, Paul and I talking, a great question. How can you say that Paul healed the man? Jesus did it. But the amazing thing about you, Lord Jesus, is that you use people that follow you. And even crazy glorify your people as they glorify you. He prayed over the man, and Jesus, you healed him, but because you were in Paul, and Paul was obedient, they attributed it to Paul healing the man. The word itself did. Not because Paul had some supernatural power, and yet he did. Because the Holy Spirit lives inside him. Just like you do inside of us, Lord. There are miraculous things you're going to do through this body, through these people, through everyone in this room just visiting, just listening. Uh, people online, God, that don't even go to this church, but believe in your name. Your Holy Spirit resides there. You made us a new creation to do new things. So we love you. And we praise you, and we ask that we go forth in that very power and grace and love and mercy with a furnace of forgiveness burning in us that keeps burning even when we're hurt. We ask that we would be like you, Jesus. Amen. Have an amazing day, everyone. God bless you. <laughs>